Blessed be our God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper, shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations, Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. That he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? He was cut off from the land of the living, stricken with the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. But it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain, when you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their inequities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, that he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And are so far from my cry, and from the words of my distress. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb, and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?
Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line give glory. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. 
So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers, together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to him, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word which he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, He went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. 
When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves, and judge him according to your own law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said, when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth 
listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went to the Jews again and told them, I find no crime against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wore the crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And striking him on the face, Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. Who, when the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Therefore Pilate said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, You are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. 
they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of a skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus, were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross on the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken, and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. The things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again another scripture says, they shall look on the one whom they have In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Mother of us all. Every year as we gather on Good Friday, I am struck by the power of John's depiction of the Passion. I am brought to my knees by the emotional depth and complexity of the story. The sorrow and responsibility of handing over Mary, the Mother of God, to the one whom Jesus loved. The sense of duty and devotion that overcame Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus as they laid the body of Jesus in the tomb. A deep and present reminder that while for us these are impactful scenes of our faith, they are also the stories of human lives. Human failings and sadness and grief. As I prayed with the gospel this week, I was overcome by the humanness of all of it. Especially when it comes to Pilate. You see, I've grown a soft spot in my heart for the governor of the Roman province of Judea. This man who seems to want so badly just to do his job, but has been dragged to the exact center of this squabble among the religious minority. I feel bad for him. He asks questions of Jesus meant to provide a chance for explanation and gets non-answer philosophical wordplay in return. He offers options to the people who instead choose blatant injustice. Pilate is stuck in the middle with an overwhelmingly important role and no way out. If this is true, if there is a way to have empathy for the Roman official responsible for sentencing Jesus Christ to death, then it begs the question, what is necessary? 
What are the elements of this narrative that are necessary for our salvation, and what are the pieces that arise from human sin and brokenness? Because we cannot talk about state-sanctioned murder and gruesome public torture without grappling with the fact that there are large swaths of this story that are born from our separation from God's love. A separation that Jesus came to heal through the resurrection. There is no such thing as all bad or all good, not even in the passion. So what is the good? What is fundamentally necessary to this narrative for our redemption? The first and the ultimate good is resurrection. But the good of resurrection is not the simple act of rising from the dead, but rather the life and the love that is breathed into us by God. A love that allows for life to overcome all that limits it. And the death from which we are necessarily resurrected is not as simple as the death of the body. It is death to self. Death to ego. Death to sin and separation from God. All in service of the greater good. As we grapple with the role of Pontius Pilate and the complexity of his character, we must hold the necessary death of Jesus, a death he freely accepted, while recognizing that the violence of the moment is not a piece of the necessary. God does not require institutional torture and public murder for the sake of our salvation, and yet it is a part of our story, a piece of who we are as Christians and as human beings. This violence is a manifestation of the things to which we are called to die. To renounce and leave behind so that we may be redeemed by our God. Pulled close and claimed as God's very own. The violence laid bare in the crucifixion of Jesus is stricken with the selfishness, ego, and sin that mark our separation from God. Mark us as so desperately in need of redemption. As Jesus comes face to face with his own death, he sees what he's doing. The truth of the matter that the death of his body is one thing, but the ushering in of the kingdom of God through his death and redemption is something wholly different. Wholly other. That his death overcomes the most broken parts of our humanity by sifting through them. As we take a step back, Seeing the complexity of the passion narrative, death of body and death of self, it makes sense that the thing to which we are called to die shows up so fully in this moment. The brokenness at the core of who we are as human beings on full display. Our stain of sin and the means of new life inextricably intertwined commingling until sifting apart what is necessary to our salvation and what our trappings of sin becomes a tale of sifting apart our very selves. And there, Pilate stands squarely in the middle of it all, holding the tension of necessary death for the sake of the redemption of God's holy people with the torture and violence and pain that can only come from a deep well of sin within the human condition. It's all there all present in the story of our faith, made manifest in the holiest of weeks. This story that is ours, that we have to sit with, grapple with, come to terms with. We stand in the midst of the mess of our sin, the mess that brought us to this very moment, and witness the terror of the violence of which we are capable, and in the same glance perceive the coming of the kingdom through the redemption of that sin. Death leading to new life, mixed with the very thing to which we must die. All intertwined. All in service to the ultimate good. Life. Love. Resurrection. But first, we face the mess. Amen.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers, and the people whom they serve, for Geoffrey, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power, and may it continually convert all your people to love and justice through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth 
and for those in authority among them. For Joseph, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Let us pray. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them, grant them the knowledge of God's love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Let us pray. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer. Let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who seek truth, for those who share our faith in Christ, for those whose beliefs differ from our own, for those who are struggling or unsure, for those who experience alienation or despair, for those who suffer persecution for their beliefs, for those who through hatred or misguided zeal persecute others, that all may be saved and come to the knowledge of your truth. Let us pray. O oh God, you created all human beings in your image and made an everlasting covenant with them. Bestow your grace on all your children, on the Jewish people, to whom you first revealed your word, on all who follow Jesus Christ as Lord, on Muslims who share with us in the heritage of Abraham, on those who follow other religious paths, and on those who are secular. Help us to overcome all hatred and strife. Unite us in the bonds of love and lead us into a deeper recognition of our common humanity and of the glory you intended for us. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that, with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. Let us pray. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility your plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up and that things which had grown old are be being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, Joy has come to the whole world. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We glory in your cross, O Lord and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, 
Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead. To your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen.